everybody, and welcome to the SIP Shelter in Place series on the STIR, which is brought to you by Gazelle Media. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin, and joining me right now is my guest co host, Debbie Baldwin, who is also an author, entertainment columnist, sitcom producer. My goodness, Debbie, the list goes on and on. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me back. Excited for our category this week. I know, this is really exciting. You know, last week we had political thrillers. This week we have something also election theme because as you know, we are really in the throes of election season. And all you have to do is turn on the TV or go on social media and those political ads are sure hard to avoid. So I don't know about you, Deb, but I have a feeling this presidential race is about to get even uglier. That it already is. Yeah, no, it started (laughs) ugly and it's going gonna go downhill for sure. I know, and so when the political fighting turns ugly, I always like to escape to the movies and fantasize about the presidents who could have been. And I'm excited as you're excited about this list because we are talking about make-believe presidents. But what we're going to do is not only highlight our favorite commanders in chief on the big screen, we're also going to talk about some favorite TV presidents as well. Definitely. Um, It was so uh, fun to make the list because there's a ton of movies, as everyone knows, where there's a character that portrays the president, particularly in disaster movies. But, you know, that's just the Oval Office answering the phone, giving the command. Um, It's sort of a phone-in role. And it was fun to research and find actors, uh, I think they're all men on this list, um, that uh, really showed another side of a president, which is just delightful for a viewer because we all wonder that as the American public, you know, what's it like to be a father as a president? What's it like to date or be married? You know, what's your relationship like with your friends? So yes, it's fun to explore those things. All right. So with that in mind, we are going to dive right into Debbie Baldwin's list. Our first movie on the list is from 1993 and it's a movie called Dave, and it is starring Kevin Klein as the American president. And, um, oh gosh, this was such a sweet movie, Deb. Um, and I mean, you talk about a film that was that's very unassuming. Um, it has a very simple comic pre- premise, which is that Dave, Kevin Klein's character, runs a temp agency in Washington, D.C., and makes a little extra money by performing as a lookalike for the president because they obviously have bear a very scary resemblance to one another. When the actual president, Bill Mitchell, who is, you know, this sort of unlikable, uh, divisive, um, you know, president within a with a strained marriage to his wife, who the first lady who's played by Sigourney Weaver, uh, has a stroke. Rather than reveal this to the public, his uh, inner circle recruits Dave to portray him as the actual president. And that's the- Dun, dun, dun. That's when the plot thickens, right? Right. So um, this movie, I remember seeing it. I remember loving it. Um, This, this premise for this movie, actually, there, we have one real life instance of this happening, and it was during the time of President Woodrow Wilson. As you may know, during his second term as president in 1919, President Wilson suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed and partially blind. And so at the time, the 25th Amendment was not yet ratified. It won't be ratified till the 60s. And instead of transferring the power to the vice president, the first lady, Edith Wilson, decided that, oh, she was just going to run the executive branch of government and um, while the president was incapacitated. And so that actually happened. Um, the the storyline here is a little different, but that kind of gives you an idea of 
<laughs> of what could happen. Yeah. Well, and for a very simple kind of sweet comedy, uh, this movie has a powerhouse cast from, you know, Oscar winners, Oscar nominees, Kevin Klein, Scorny Weaver, Frank Langella, Ben Kingsley, um, Charles Grodin in this Ivan Reitman directed film, which is brilliant on so many levels. Um, it's Dave, the Dave character, kind of imposing his own uh, priorities on the presidency and seeing, you know, what he can get away with in this role in, of impersonating the president. And um, the, the best scene in the entire movie, in my opinion, I mean, there's a, there's, um, almost too many that are close. Oh, let's to hear it. <laughs> is Dave brings in his best friend, played by Charles Grodin, who's an accountant, <laughs> to have him go over the budget for the United States government. And I mean, in the audience, you're just falling over laughing. I think is the classic line is, "You could never run a business like this." Like he's looking <laughs> through the expenses. And we're all like, you know, the audience is all sitting there like, maybe that's what we need. <laughs> uh, but it's just a really classic moment. And there's so many. It's a great, great movie. If you haven't seen Dave, it's a must. It, you it, must see it's it. It's a must see for sure. Yes. So when I think of the movie Dave, I kind of think of that movie hand in hand with the, the next movie. Um, just because it, it, it does portray the president's more personal side and um, just two really sweet, really, really excellent movies. And I'm talking about 1995's The American President, and that stars Michael Douglas as President Andrew, Andrew Shepard. Uh, Michael Douglas is, I mean, you can think of sort of a handful of actors when you think of, if you were casting a film, who you would cast as the president. And Michael Douglas is certainly on that list. He's charismatic, he's diplomatic, he is articulate, he just looks presidential. Um, he plays a president running for reelection, who's trying to pass a sort of wishy-washy crime bill. Um, he meets Annette Benning's character. Um, who is um, sort of an activist trying to get a, actually it's interesting in 1993 was this movie? 95. Uh, 95 that she's trying to get a zero footprint carbon emissions bill. Yeah, uh-huh, uh -huh. you know, The handwriting's been on the wall a long time. And um, he's widowed, the president, and mm -hmm. it's a story of him trying to date her and there's political stuff in the undercurrent going on. Um, it's actually an Aaron Sorkin film, which um, he, as you know, is the creator of the West Wing. And um, so obviously this is a topic that is near and dear to him. Um, and so there is this kind of running current of the politics and the setups and, you know, people undermining other people's actions and it voices all of our frustrations about how things never really get done, but the um, kind of overarching storyline is this romance. So it's a very um, charming, elegant movie. Um, Which is really what I loved, characters. loved about this film, because how does a president who's a widower date? I mean, yes. just that one scene when he's trying to order flowers for her. Is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> comical and yes. and you alluded to the fact about this cast I mean this is like a dream cast to me personally a dream director Rob Reiner dream writer and Aaron Sorkin and these names you know Martin Sheen Anna DeVere Smith Bo Billingsley Joshua Molina Molina Richard Dreyfus. yeah yes. it goes on yes. and on it's and a lot of those names cast. are going to appear reappear later when we talk about another president on the list um, that's because several years later, Aaron Sorkin, you know, brings uh, much of this cast back together and yes. he said all to appear in his TV masterpiece, The West Wing. So, um, yes. so yeah, this was, I guess, the, the, the pre-West Wing Sorkin here. <laughs> so, all right. Um, just a, a note, the Oval Office for this film, for the American President, um, was reused for the movie Nixon, 
and was also reused for our next movie, which is, uh, came out a year later in 1996, and that is the movie Independence Day, and this time with Bill Pullman as president. Now, I, I mean, I can sort of imagine these studio heads, if one studio has gone to the trouble and great expense to recreate the Oval Office, that these studio heads are thing, all kind right? of like, hey, can we, can we borrow that set? Um, but um, so yeah, I can imagine that a, a, that set was reused on several films. Um, Independence Day, Bill Pullman plays the president. I mean, it's pales, his performance kind of pales in comparison to the grandeur of the whole movie. I mean, what a blockbuster. It's sort of the definition of a summer blockbuster. Fourth of July, alien invasion. Will Smith is the real hero of the film. Again, a huge all-star cast. Jeff Goldblum, Judd Hirsch, it goes on and on. The people that are in this movie, Harry Connick. Um, but Bill Pullman plays a, you know, a combat veteran who's now the president of the United States. So he gets to get in on the alien fighting action. Um, so he's not all just pomp and speeches. And Bill Pullman is such a likable actor. And it's funny because uh -huh. we talk about likability in these presidential elections and, um, you know, candidates have, needing to have likability. And I guess, you know, it's certainly true of actors and perhaps more appropriate <laughs> of actors that they be likable in certain roles sure. um, and Bill Pullman is definitely one of those actors I really enjoy seeing in anything he's in and he's great in this movie as the president and and it really you know really uh, hit the right note for the president because you funny you should mention the fact that you know compared to the grandeur of this movie his role yeah. was a little subdued yeah this um, the script was initially written for um, a Nixon-like character, and it was specifically written for Kevin Spacey, believe it or not, Deb, <laughs> because Kevin that. Spacey was Dean Devlin's friend. Dean Devlin, of course, co-wrote the, the script for this movie, um, but the studio nixed the idea because they said, uh, quote, about Kevin Spacey, that he didn't have the potential to be a big star. So they didn't like the idea of Kevin Spacey starring in this movie. And so when Bill Pullman got the role, they had to rewrite the script to fit Bill Pullman. But I, you know, when you mentioned that, I kind of thought, I don't know if that would have contributed to the movie having Kevin Spacey or you would have had too much stuff going on because you know how Kevin Spacey right. acts. He, he goes big, you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. Right, and Bill Pullman meshes well with the whole uh, almost ensemble cast of the show and that, um, yes, yeah, Spacey is a character actor for sure. And scandal aside, um, you know, it definitely would have had a different feel with him in that role for sure, yeah. Yes, and you know, this movie, Independence Day, really uh, is remembered, consider the benchmark in terms of a high scale, big budget disaster film. Yeah. Uh, it was the highest grossing film of 1996. Roland Emmerich, who co-wrote and directed the film, he was asked about the origin of, of the plot of this movie. And he was, you know, when he talked about it, he said, well, I wanted to answer this question. When you have, mostly with alien invasion movies, the aliens come to Earth and they're hiding in a farm or they come in, you know, they arrive in little spores. And he was thinking, if you travel billions of light years away across the galaxy, wouldn't you go big and make, make a big difference? <laughs> exactly. So that was the premise of this film. Um, what's it like to wake up one morning and find 15 mile wide spaceships hovering across, you know, the biggest cities of the world? And um, so, yeah, and so Independence Day was born. And just to give you an idea about the magnitude of this film, the studio spent $30 million in marketing for the video release of this film. Marketing alone. I mean, there are filmmakers out there who hope to gross that much on the film. <laughs> That's how much they spent advertising and, and marketing the film, the film before it went to video. 
So yeah. this is some serious money we're talking. Right, it paid off for them, definitely. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move on to a film. Okay, I have to admit, I have not seen this movie, Deb, but when I saw the cast, I am just, you know, dying to see it already. And we're talking about the film Mars Attacks, and it stars Jack Nicholson as the president. Now, I will say this is a not a niche film, but it's a quirky film for sure. It's if you're a Tim Burton fan, it should absolutely be on your list. And I didn't even relate the film uh, with it Tim Burton. I was surprised to find that out. A bizarre little comedy. <laughs> it is very stylized. It has, to me, very much a Doctor Strange love feel to it. Um, I mean, it's hilarious. The you know the opening. Uh, swore uh, the opening uh, encounter between the aliens and the u.s and they are having this very diplomatic meeting and the aliens are ridiculous looking with these big heads with a <laughs> exterior brain and uh this kind of hippie guy at the end of the meeting releases a dove into the air as a sign of peace and the and the, and the martians all shoot it and immediately annihilate everyone who's there and then they the government's like oh well, maybe this is just a misunderstanding meanwhile the Martians are just plowing through and killing everybody. Uh, Jack Nicholson plays the president and he's actually in a dual role in this. He plays also this sort of Vegas cowboy gambler guy. And the <laughs> whole movie is ridiculous and hilarious. And, um, you know, just a, a, the, 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 they realize at the end that they can combat the Martians by playing the Indian love song by Slim Whitman, which is, oh, a, boy. <laughs> is a yodeling, crooning song from the 50s. I mean, it's the level of absurdity with fantastic social commentary and fantastic satire is just a very, very interesting movie. It sounds like it. And from yeah. what I understand, Jack Nicholson, um, accepted the role without even reading the script. Um, apparently, he'd worked with Tim Burton in Batman and enjoyed it so much that he wanted to work with him again. And, and the cast, the I was astounded. Yeah. The cast, um, my goodness. So we have Nicholson, um, Glenn Close, Annette Bening, Pierce Bronson, Danny DeVito, Natalie Portman, Sarah Jessica Parker, the list goes on. Michael J. Fox, I mean, it's, it, a-list cast. Even it, Tom it, Jones was in it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a little hidden gem, this movie. I, I laughed out loud multiple times the first time I saw it. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. All right, so we're going to move on. Our next president on the list, Deb, I understand this character is one at the top of your list. And we are talking about President James Marshall and that is Harrison Ford in Air Force One. I mean, this has to be at the top of everybody's list. There's no better, as much as I love Kevin Klein's portrayal of Dave, they're really, Harrison Ford in Air Force One is a presidential portrayal in a league of its own. Hello, yeah. <laughs> He's uh, also another war hero president here who is, um, you know, after seizing a, uh, it's some sort of Eastern European uh, general or dictator is returning back to the United States on Air Force One with his family and a team of journalists hijack Air Force One, have had the, 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 the terrorist group is head by Gary Oldman, um, who is- Really, really scary, creepy. Talk oh about a gosh. brilliant pairing because Ford is so, um, sort of a calm, centered, um, vulnerable actor. And Oldman is such a, an intense actor. Uh, the two of them together on screen are unbeatable. Um, and it's just Harrison Ford saving the day and instead of playing the role of this, you know, staid diplomatic president, he has to turn into the warrior he once was. And it, it does not disappoint on any level. This movie is a, one of the best action films. It's unfortunately, the technology does not hold up as well um, as it could be. They might, it, it might be worth a remake this movie because, you know, obviously in 20 years that the, so much has improved for the CGI and, and the, even the filming 
uh, airplanes in flight and stuff like that. But it's still absolutely worth every second of watching it. All right, so you mentioned the chemistry between Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman. You know, it probably translated on the screen because apparently between takes, those two got along so well. Um, the cast and crew were entertained by those two just, you know, fooling around the entire time, being such a, a comedic team. And, you know, really fortunate for the cast and crew because a lot of these villain type characters, like the one that Gary Oldman plays, um, they like to stay in character throughout the entire filming. But apparently Oldman was the exact opposite off camera that the director actually named the, the film Air Force Fun because, <laughs> because it was such a fun set to be around. I'm honestly so happy to hear that because you hear <laughs> like you hope, you know, you kind of hope that people like that are friends in real life and you hear these stories and you think, I, I couldn't, I didn't know whether you were going to say offset they were and I was waiting for you to finish the sentence because it's yeah. like, hated each other. No, no, you know, no. Harrison Ford is, is traditionally a difficult guy on set, and I don't know any stories about Gary Oldman, but... Right, so apparently Harrison yeah. Ford had Could mentioned... Gone either way. <laughs> yeah, Harrison Ford had mentioned in a later interview that, you know, Gary Oldman's portrayal um, of that hijacker is one of his favorite villains of all time. Yeah. So, um, and you mentioned the thing about the technology. You know, funny how a lot of these films happen during the Clinton presidency. Um, when Independence Day had it showing at the White House, uh, the director, Roland Emmerich, actually had a seat next to Bill Clinton, but instead he gave up his seat to Bill Pullman because he um, did not want to upset the president when that scene about the White House being blown up is shown. <laughs> so we jump to this movie, Air Force One. So Air Force One in the movie is shown having a, a one-person escape pod where the president supposedly escapes yes. at the beginning of the movie. Um, the actual aircraft at the time did not have one. And how did we find that out? Well, Bill Clinton was such a big fan of this movie. He pointed it out. Uh, Air Force oh, One doesn't gosh, have an escape God. pod. <laughs> he, he was such a big fan. He saw it twice. Right now, we don't know about Air Force One. You know, after this movie, they might have upgraded to, to have at least one escape pod now. <laughs> All right, so our next movie is, um, was released in 1997. Uh, one of my favorite movies on this oh. list. Uh, just so intense, and I just love, love, love it. And that is Absolute Power. The star of the movie, of course, was Clint Eastwood. But we're talking about presidents, and the president in this movie is Gene Hackman. This is a fantastic movie. Uh, it's based on the David Baldacci novel of the same name, a fellow UVA law school graduate, Ooh. so uh, wahoo -wah. <laughs> Um Clint Eastwood plays a burglar, uh, and he's mid-burgle when <laughs> the... When the homeowner, the the wife of the homeowner, comes home with her lover, who happens to be Gene Hackman, the president of the United States, and they, uh, Clint Eastwood's character conceals himself behind this very strange closet with a two-way mirror, with a large throne-like chair in it, which you suspect that the much older husband of this woman uses to, you know, for some purient reasons. <laughs> Sit on a throne. Um, and watch his wife. <laughs> and um, so anyway, while Luther, the Clint Eastwood character, the burglar is watching, their little sexual encounter turns a little nasty. And the woman, in an attempt to kind of defend herself, stabs the president with a letter opener which immediately brings the Secret Service into the room and they shoot her dead. So there's the premise. You have, they conceal the entire thing to make it look like a robbery. Oh, coincidentally, there is a robbery going on at that time. <laughs> so guess who genius. everyone's after? Which is genius, yes. It is genius. The setup is genius. And, and so Clint Eastwood's character immediately knows he's screwed and he's going to have to turn the tables or take the fall. And that's, it's a 
brilliant film. It never disappoints. It's extremely smart all the way through. Gene Hackman is the perfect kind of skeevy, you know, yes. president who, you know, is trying to keep this buried and will do, you know, at any cost. And uh, Gene Hackman is on my top 10 list of best actors. He is always great to watch. And in this role, he doesn't disappoint. You know, in fact, also gave special mention to his role also as president, but it was in a comedy called Welcome to Mooseport. You know, we actually should talk about Welcome to Mooseport because that movie, I know most people watching this have not seen it. Write it down on your list. It is such a charming, funny, little independent film about a retired president, again played by Hackman, who goes to his summer community in Maine to, to relax and escape this brutal divorce from his soon-to-be ex-wife. When he discovers, he basically gets roped into running for mayor of this tiny little town <laughs> because in a roundabout way, it's gonna allow him to keep his wife from getting her hands on this vacation house. He's running against his handyman, who's played by Ray Romano. Ray Romano. <laughs> and it, it's just this little microcosm of the insanity of politics. The president's strategy team ends up coming up to this little town in Maine to help him win this life. I mean, it's about friendships. It's about love. It's about honesty and doing the right thing. And it's a very, very enjoyable, fun family film. And you know, Gene Hackman, you're right. I mean, he's such a talent. He can do drama, he can do comedy and really excel in both. Yeah, and I mean, the premise of just, of having a former president of the United States <laughs> for mayor in this town of, you know, 200 people is just genius. Sure. All right, so we're gonna move on and we are moving to 1998's Deep Impact. We'll talk about another alien disaster film um, this time around. The president is Morgan Freeman. You may recall this was released the same year as Armageddon, which actually fared a little better at the box office, but astronomers have stated time and again that Deep Impact um, was actually more scientifically accurate than Armageddon. So there you have it. <laughs> which, is, which is exactly where Deep Impact went wrong. Deep Impact, you can tell it's a better film on its face. It's trying to be this bizarre hybrid of an action film and a legitimate thriller. Um, and it almost succeeds. Um, it's the same premise as Armageddon. As you said, a giant meteor is headed to Earth or an asteroid, I'm, a big rock is about to hit Something the Something <laughs> is about to hit the Earth. <laughs> and they refer to it as an ELE, an extinction level event. In a way, it's sort of this weird cross between Armageddon and Apollo 13. You know what I mean? This like- Yes, sort it tries to be a little bit more serious. Yes, and again, as you said, it's a little more scientific. Um, you know, in Armageddon, they're drilling other, uh, anyway, I don't want to get it too involved in this, but <laughs> Morgan Freeman plays the president and yeah. he's great, as you can imagine. And Morgan Freeman should run for president. He's looks so presidential. He's got that honey voice and sort of a natural leadership about him and his compassionate sort of intelligent president presidential portrayal is great in the movie and it's very instrumental in the film you know as opposed to oh I think so to figurehead yeah well you know you, you said that we really shouldn't be talking about Armageddon but it's funny mm -hmm. how these two movies just kind of are always in each other's you know uh yeah. way um in Armageddon well no actually in Deep Impact you know when uh, President what's his name, Morgan Freeman, President Beck, um, gives his speech at the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, he was originally to have said, life will go on, we will prevail, this is not Armageddon. And um, 
When the producers realized that they were going to be in direct competition with Armageddon, that line was dropped. And so you have this now famous quote from the movie, life uh -huh. will go on, we will prevail. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, you're talking about Morgan Freeman. All you really need to hear is that voice. He apparently wanted uh, to appear with an earring on his ear as president. The director nixed that idea, but apparently they came to some sort of a compromise because during his speech, you do see him with his sleeves rolled up and you see a little tattoo peeking out. Um, <laughs> so that was the compromise. And the director, Mimi, is it letter or leader? She agreed to, to have the tattoo because it shows you that the president, you know, was in the same situation as everyone else. He was an everyman and, and, and that, uh, that happened and that was allowed to stay on. And, and as you point out the director, it's one of the few kind of big budget disaster films that's directed by a woman. Yes, of course, yeah, which is, you know, again, uh, amazing movie and I, I it was always my favorite of the two yeah. i was always haunted by that image in the movie of the statue of liberty's head floating in the streets of manhattan <laughs> um you know that that always had stayed with me and um we're talking about morgan freeman being president here he the studio reportedly objected uh, at the beginning you know to him being cast as president for this movie uh, reportedly telling the director it wasn't realistic to cast a black man as president. One studio executive is quoted as saying, we're not making a science fiction movie. You can't have Morgan Freeman play the president. Well, wrong and wrong. It was a science fiction movie. And yes, we can have a black president. <laughs> It's just yeah, always fascinating to hear what happened behind the scenes. I, I love when movies cast against type. It's always, for me, it makes it for a very interesting, engaging film. You think, oh, you know, there's a woman playing a vice president like Glenn Close in Air Force One or, you know, a black man playing president, which now is obviously a fantastic reality. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know, uh, in film and plays and theater, absolutely do that. Why, you know, the break boundaries, that's what their job is, you know? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so for our next film, this is actually the only movie on the list, Deb, that is about an actual commander in chief, or at least uh, we are led to believe. And that is the movie Primary Colors with John Travolta, as uh, Governor Jack Staunton of Arkansas, and then later President Jack Staunton. And um, based on a real president, lowest grossing movie of the list. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we like to fantasize. Movies are all about escape and fantasy. Yeah. Um, Primary Colors is based on a book. Uh, it's called a roman a clef, which is a French term for a novel with a fictional overlay over a nonfiction story. And so it was originally anonymously written um, about the campaign of Bill Clinton <clears throat> in 1992. Uh, the writer eventually came out. It was Joe Klein from Newsweek. Yes. And um, it's the story of you know, a charming, charismatic, womanizing governor from Arkansas <laughs> who was seeking the Democratic primary for president in 1992. Um, <laughs> you know, John Travolta does a good job playing. Oh, Clinton. he sure does. Yes. Um, you know, as we said, this is the only actual president on the list. And so we, to be fair, you have to compare him to the real man. I don't know if anyone could play Clinton. <laughs> Clinton plays himself so well. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and it's just the story of Bill and Hillary winning that nomination. Ultimately, the film ends with him in the White House. Um, but I'm sure you've got some juicy little tidbits. Oh, damn! <laughs> Funny you mentioned that because this is actually 
the juiciest gossip I was able to glean out of all the movies of this entire list. Are you ready for this? I'm Are you sitting so down? Ready. Okay. So Emma Thompson, who plays First Lady Susan Staunton, um, during filming received a phone call while she was in her trailer. Do you know about this? Because I do not. I've, oh my God. Okay. So in between takes, she was in her trailer. She received a phone call. The person on the other line was none other than Donald Trump. Okay. So this was in 19, uh, 1998. So Donald Trump was apparently calling to ask her out on a date. And according to a Vanity Fair interview with Emma Thompson, um, he had offered her accommodations, quote, in one of my beautiful establishments and perhaps dinner. This is according to Emma Thompson in Vanity Fair. But at the time, she didn't really know him. So she told him, well, that's very kind of you. I'll ring you later. And of course, she never did. So now she, <laughs> she has bemoaned the fact that she did not go on that date. Um, she said, I could have done something. So can you imagine? Can you imagine? <laughs> um, you know, it's a good story though. I, I don't picture Emma Thompson as Trump's type. Well, uh, I had no comment. <laughs> she's, she's a little too outspoken for him, I would think, but, um, I don't think he knew that at the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's a wonderful actress. She's so, I mean, her, her roles, everything from Love Actually to her earlier roles, she is just wonderful to watch on screen. You feel her, you really yeah. do. Um, the emotions that her characters go through. She's kind of like a Meryl Streep to me where you just really, you know, just, yeah go on that journey with layered yes. yeah the yes. performances are layered for sure so this movie was actually released during the clinton presidency actually right around the time of the the lewinsky affair so um so that also may be the reason why it didn't fare very well because real life was going on and real life was probably more That's, exciting right exactly <laughs> all right so our next film, we're gonna jump to the 2000s and we are gonna talk about 2004's Chasing Liberty. And um, our president this time around is Mark Harmon. And Mark Harmon's another one of those actors, very presidential. He's got sort of yes. a Kennedy-esque quality about him. Um, and this sort of, this movie, which is a very charming romantic comedy that I don't think a lot of people have seen it particularly if you have younger, um, you know, teenage daughters or even younger. Um, I think there is a sort of closed door intimate scene between Mandy Moore and Matthew Good, who are the two main characters, but it's pretty tame. And it's a very good, sweet adventure uh, love story um, if you're looking for films for that age group. Um, yeah. And it sort of, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, it answers these questions about what's the president like as a boyfriend? What's the president like as a husband? What's the president like as a father? And this is Mandy Moore plays the president's 18 year old daughter who is upset, as you can well imagine what happened, yeah. that she is being too stifled by her Secret Service detail. Um, her code name is Liberty. And she negotiates with Harmon, who plays her overprotective father, um, and understandably overprotective father, I should say. And when he agrees to pull back on her security, she feels a little betrayed because she knows she's being followed by Secret Service agents at this concert. So she escapes with a cute guy on a motorcycle. <laughs> which she does not realize is also a Secret Service agent. The president, Mark Harmon's character, takes this opportunity to say to the attractive young man on the motorcycle, who also happens to be a Secret Service agent, Matthew Good, is the actor, 
keep playing this role. Like, stay close to her, be her travel buddy. And of course, you can guess what happens. Right, yeah. Um, and they travel all about and have this wonderful European adventure shot against this fantastic backdrop. I'm emphasizing the role of the portrayal of the president a little less in this film. He really is not instrumental in the plot, but it is a nice depiction of president sure. as father. Sure, definitely. And, you know, we are in the year 2004 here uh, for this movie, and yet we're still um, seeing glimpses of the Clinton presidency because apparently the storyline was inspired by uh, Chelsea Clinton, who was spotted at one point trying to blend in into the crowd during a college basketball game and, you know, what that must have been like for her. Yeah. All right, so um, our next movie, I mean, just thinking about the movie is making me laugh, but we are going to talk about the movie Head of State, starring Chris Rock as the president. And as a bonus, we also have the late, great Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac, stars yes. as his, uh, Chris Rock's brother and also running mate. <laughs> and you, you know, you watch this movie and you think you, the world lost a great comic mind when Bernie Mac passed away. He is really something to watch. <laughs> um, it, with so few words. Yes, he has so such a presence. Magic yeah. on the screen, yeah. And Chris Rock, it's a very simple story where his party knows they're going to lose the election and a heavily favored incumbent is running for re-election. So they choose a minority guy who has no chance of winning. He's sort of an anonymous he guy. He's an alderman, I think. Yes. <laughs> and um, lo and behold, the outspoken, uh, always opinionated character played by Chris Rock starts to catch the attention of the voters. And it's just that campaign and his message speaking to his constituents and the voters and the comedy, which as you know, I mean, there's so Hilarious. many things that are just laugh out loud funny. But um, yeah, so <laughs> head of state. And this is a real, uh, well, this is a real, um, Chris Rock is the center vehicle of the film. It's not a, plot of something else right. the character, like title and, character. Like the, yes it's a movie about you know chris rock so and i mean i could watch him his stand-up is stand up is wonderful so impeccable <laughs> yes funny smart the timing the delivery his personality everything and it translates really well onto film which isn't always the case with stand-up comics as you know um so yeah head of state is a great comedy really really funny so many laugh out loud scenes yes. and one scene in particular i'm thinking about deb we all know what the electric slide is right you know what the electric slide is everyone Sadly, apparently yes. but chris rock knew what it was and had to be taught during the filming of this movie for <laughs> that scene and you know a little bit of trivia with in terms of that scene the song that was playing was nelly's hot in here <laughs> <laughs> well, hilarious. When you say the electric slide, it makes me think of a wedding and it makes me think of Billy Crystal's great line from When Harry Met Sally when he says, Did you, were you dancing doing the white man's overbite on the dance floor? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it makes sense that Chris Rock didn't know the electric slide. He's too cool. <laughs> Probably, yes. And that's what we love about Chris Rock. He's, he's pretty cool. He oozes yeah. cool without even trying. Yeah. So there you have it. So that ends our list of movies, of make-believe movie presidents. We're now going to move on to our honorable mentions, and we're talking about uh, TV presidents who really have made such an impression on, you know, the, the pop culture uh, psyche. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start first with, my goodness, House of Cards. How can you not include Kevin Spacey's um, Frank Underwood on this list? Yeah, and when you talk about, you know, we talked briefly about Spacey being, you know, considered for the role in Independence Day. 
this role, the House of Cards role, that's the president Kevin Spacey should be playing. Exactly. Um, you know, where he's the catalyst for events in the film, and he has, a, I mean, edge might be too mild a word <laughs> to describe what Frank Underwood has, but um, yeah, he's no hero. And Kevin Spacey, again, scandal aside, I know it's like horrible, all these, when all those news stories broke. Yeah. His acting, if we can separate the man from the actor, is incredible in House of Cards. And he's, you know, always so complex in his portrayals. And this is, you know, obviously no exception. He's made that show and you know he had tons of trouble selling it he was attached to the project and was pitching it with the producers and finally sold it to netflix and then obviously we all know what happened after that but yeah he's a right. great evil president <laughs> oh my gosh i mean he really has the ability to balance that you know he can be one who can be charismatic and cloyingly sweet one minute and then all of a sudden, you know, he's ruthless and <laughs> the worst yeah. person in the world. Um, I'm trying to remember that movie. He was in it with Kevin Klein, their next door neighbors. Oh, I don't He know. gets Kevin Klein like an insurance settlement. He hits him with his car on purpose. I know th there's this very strange movie. I have to look it up. Oh, we are going to have to look that up because yeah. that intrigues it's me a now. Weird movie, but it's good and sort of evil. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of mirrors what we're hearing about how he was in real life <laughs> um so yeah so that's kevin spacey house of cards our next tv president oh my god i just swoon every time i think about him as president and that is dennis hayes birth um from the series 24 of course which starred Kiefer sutherland but dennis hayes birth really um you know as president david palmer playing opposite jack bauer Wow, so yeah. memorable. I mean, he really brought that show to another level. He was an involved character as the president in, you know, the fantastic series 24, um, which the early season starred our own St. Louis's own John Burroughs grad, Sarah Clark, yeah. as the villain. Um, and um, it's, you know, a great binge watch if anyone's looking for something they may have passed over. I totally agree. Um, yeah, and Dennis Haysbert is so actively involved in the show and the role of that little crime group, crime fighting group. Um, and it's, he's diplomatic and presidentially has that air about him while also having this kind of passion uh, below the surface that is perfect for that part and just makes the show so much better with him involved. Absolutely. Yeah, he was really the best fit for that role, I thought. He really, um, you know, brought that certain gravitas to that role. Yeah. The commanding president. So yeah, um, President David Palmer on 24. Okay, so our last president, I have to say, is my favorite um, TV or movie, and we're talking about President Josiah Bartlett of the West Wing, and that is Martin Sheen, you know, such an idealist, an advocate for social justice, and I think the reason that worked is because Martin Sheen himself has, you know, has lived that yeah. life, you know, he's been on the front lines of protests for decades, and yeah. wow. Um, Martin Sheen is a fantastic actor he portrays that president and we have to give i have to give a little high five to sorkin because this has to be one of the first presidents who has an even remotely interesting name i mean <laughs> if you go down the list of the characters that bill mitchell james marshall right shepherd james foster pretty ho-hum I mean, yes could they pick i mean i get like george washington we've got some millard fillmore we've got some memorable names in our presidents <laughs> why do all the movie presidents have to have such boring names yeah, it's a movie they can do whatever they want yes, right so josiah bartlett is um a 
good, interesting choice. Martin Sheen is a, both a great actor and you can tell it's a passion project for really everybody involved in The West Wing. The viewers loved it. People who watched The West Wing were loyal to the end for that. Oh, we were riveted. Oh yeah. my gosh, yes. You couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. All right, so the show, according to everyone involved, wasn't supposed to center around uh, President Bartlett. In fact, it was supposed to focus on the West Wing staffers initially because that's, that was the premise of the show. Um, but then, you know, Martin Sheen, how could you have him only, you know, like once a month? <laughs> so it, it just kind of evolved into, you know, also developing this character who is, has been referred to as the most popular Democratic president in recent memory. I mean, people really fantasize about Martin Sheen as president. You take um, the surveys, you ask people, ask you who is, who's the, your favorite president and people are saying Martin, Martin Sheen. Sheen. Martin Sheen, Martin <laughs> Sheen. Okay, so Deb, I have actually met Martin Sheen in person. I um, sat next to him at a dinner at the St. Louis Club. I introduced him uh, before he spoke. And this was in 2014. And so during dinner, we were talking and um, he was telling me that the following day, he was getting on a plane to LA to start production on this new show called uh, Grace and Frankie or something or other. <laughs> so, you know, as you know, Grace and Frankie uh, has really been a hit for Netflix, but, um, he also told me that he hated to fly. He hated flying, but it, he had to get on that plane because they were gonna start production on Grace and Frankie that afternoon. And I jokingly, well, not really jokingly, but I told him, just say the word, Mr. Sheen, I can get on the car, drop everything, and drive you to California. <laughs> but we can leave right now. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll stop everything. I'll drive you to California. I'll get you there tomorrow afternoon. But yeah, but um, that was really a, a really cool look into the, the upcoming project, which turned out to be, you know, a phenomenon. For it hit. Yeah, that's a great story. I love that. <laughs> and um, so that ends our list of make-believe presidents. Uh, just a great list of movies. And, yeah. you know recommend any of these movies really on this list and i mean last week i've gone back and rewatched a couple from our list including yeah. in the line of fire which i left off <laughs> i rewatched ghost rider which was every bit as good as i remembered yeah um, and i got a couple of these on my queue as well to watch so i'm pretty excited there you go so as you know some kind of like an, <laughs> an overarching uh a theme here was the clinton presidency yes <laughs> so yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Clinton was an entertaining president. There was a lot going on, a lot happening politically and a lot happening in his personal life. So, you know, it was fertile soil for filmmaking. Yeah. Well, you know what? For our bonus sweet treat, we're actually going to be inspired by uh, Bill Clinton and his Southern way. Okay. So we are making fried pies, um, fried cherry pie to be exact with if you're feeling a little ambitious you can make homemade cherry pie filling but um we're gonna make it with homemade cherry pie filling and store-bought pastry dough and you know before you that it's not healthy that's gonna be deep fried actually if you are lucky enough to have an air fryer and it is just life-changing really um, you can make these in an air fryer and avoid all that fatty oil all together and it tastes the same and it's just yum, yum, yum. All right, good to know. That sounds great. It makes me think of those little hostess pies we used to get in our lunch. Yeah, or like the, the little apple pies that you get at McDonald's. But those yeah, yeah. Are, oh, know, yeah. Deep fried, but those are deep fried. Closer. This is going to be, oh my goodness, it's, it's yummy. And of course, you can make it with any fruit, uh, peach, apple, what have you, blueberry. Um, I've just tried it with cherry and I can't wait to try it with the rest of the fruits. So, um, so yes, we will have that recipe for you on Gazelle Magazine. That All right, great. Um, all right, Debbie, thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, this has been another fun show. May God bless you all. God bless you, Debbie Baldwin, and may God bless the United, United States, States of America. Yeah. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>